There's a house designed by the architect Le Corbusier that directly influenced the design of thousands and thousands of houses built in the United States. But Le Corbusier's original was never built. Until today, it's only lived in line drawings and in writings. It's called the Erasuris House, and in this video we're going to take a virtual tour of the house to uncover exactly why this house spawned so much admiration. Stay tuned. Hello, my name is Stuart Hicks, and I teach architecture and design studios and lecture courses at the University of Illinois at Chicago. In one of those courses that I teach, there's this lecture that I've been giving where we look at the difference between a diagrammatic house and one that has more spatial and architecturally integrated layout. That house is the Arasuris House by Le Corbusier, and it's been constantly written about and lectured about and copied ever since its inception. No one really knows why the house was never built, but its primary feature, what's called a butterfly roof, which peaks downward in the middle, was invented right here with this design. It also pulls on one of the sides so that it's uneven and one's longer than the other. And this design would be copied by so many houses ever after. The actual building was commissioned by a diplomat and a Chilean ambassador to Argentina for a site in the city of Zapolar that was overlooking the Pacific Ocean. And in the rest of this video, we'll model the building in 3D, we'll analyze this design and take a virtual tour of it using a program called Enscape. There's a link in the description below that will take you to another window in your browser where you can tour the house yourself without any extra software. Also, this video is broken down into chapters to navigate through the parts that you find the most important. So, without any further ado, let's dive into the Arasuris house, beginning with the timeline. The Arasuris house was designed by Le Corbusier in 1930 as a summer home for Artozar Matias Arasuris, a diplomat and Chilean ambassador to Argentina. Arasuris never ended up constructing the building for reasons that remain unknown. However, the building was published soon after its design and it had a huge impact on architecture ever after. Le Corbusier was born charles Edouard Jeanneret in 1887 in a French-speaking area of Switzerland. The town was important for watchmaking and his father was an artist that decorated watches in their boxes. And when young Charles studied art in school, much of the education was geared toward watchmaking, pun intended. It was his art teachers that encouraged him to pursue architecture, though he never studied it formally. It was a friend of his art teacher that commissioned the first house that he designed when he was armed only with knowledge gained from reading books, traveling, and sketching. After this, he traveled to Paris, where he worked as a draftsman for the architect Auguste Paré, where he would study the techniques of concrete construction. He would travel to Germany to work for Peter Behrens, where Mies van der Rohe and Walter Gropius both also worked. The couple years where these three overlapped here would make this place and time one of the most important incubators of modern architectural design. Shortly after this work experience, he would design and build a house for his parents and the Schwab House, neither of which would yet exhibit the iconic architectural principles that would develop in the early 1920s and manifest in L'Esprit Nouveau, Pavilion, and the Villa Savoie. The Arasuris House came after these, and during a time when Le Corbusier was seeking commissions all across Europe and even more remote places like Moscow and in South America. Of course, Le Corbusier would become one of the most important architects to have ever lived, and his design work has influenced generations. For more, check out the video in the upper right corner to learn more about his open plan strategies. But this house has its own unique cascade of influence with people like Antonin Raymond, who built a house in the city of Kurosawa, Japan that is almost identical to the Arasuri's house. Some have even attributed the uneven butterfly roof design as influence for what would become a hugely iconic profile in Southern California. Its proliferation is the product of a push to construct tens of thousands of homes during the 1950s, all made by the Alexander Construction Company, who adopted it as part of their signature style. Le Corbusier's influence extends well beyond this building, and his later life was marked by masterpieces such as Ronchamp or the Carpenter Center in Boston, which was completed shortly before his death at the age of 79 in 1965. The Arasuris house is not very large and not very complicated in its layout. The overall building is broken into two parts, the main house and a smaller adjacent structure for the staff and the guest room. The main building is basically one large space with a grid of wooden structure inside and a ramp that takes you up to a lofted bedroom on the second level. One of the early things that I noticed about the geometry of the building is that the outside module, as indicated by the windows on this outer wall, are different from the structural grid of the columns on the interior. And so sometimes they, they sort of align, but then in other places they misalign at the end of the building here. If 
If you trace the line between the um, column grid of the interior versus the um, implied column grid or the implied grid of the interior from the exterior turn-ins, you get something that also accelerates outward from skinny ones on this end of the building to wider, fatter ones on this end of the building. There's also a modularity to the structure that has to do with squares and then half squares and then slivers or a kind of quarter of a square here, here at the end. One of the overall results of these relationships of the geometry and the plan is what I think is like an acceleration of the view outward into the landscape. It makes the house look a little bit longer than it is from the interior, making the window and what's framed inside of this main window appear even more grand. There's a very tight-knit relationship between the view that you're having and the structure itself. So rather than your view being dictated by a regular structural module, the structure is actually manipulated to provide a specific kind of experience. And this tends to reverse our expectations of the dependency between things. Normally our view is dictated by a regular structure, but in this case the structure is irregular in, in accordance to making our view being even the more spectacular. In the section of the building, there are more specific relationships where the building, the paths of movement, and the space all work together. The ramp is a key feature, and the angle of the ramp is actually the same angle as the roof above. You go up the first part of that ramp, whose axis extends straight out into the landscape through the main window, and at the crease of the roof, right here, you turn around and you face the other way. And the ramp angle again is the same as the roof as your view extends out another window up, uh, up in the loft area above. I also noticed in the section how the if you extend the line of the ramp, it goes to the very edge of the um, column grid here, or on this side, it goes to the edge of the house. So there's this, this um, little gap right here in the house which seems really important. Um, you know, this seems like it would be a natural termination point for the house, but the house is just a little bit bigger. I think that has to do with that idea of the acceleration of the view outward, um, as well as presenting the landscape so that it feels a little bit more grand uh, than it would otherwise. One thing that I noticed about um, the representations uh, that Le Corbusier has of this house is are particularly in the perspectives of the interior, which are done in a very wide angle view, and they tend to emit things. So in one, they cut off the ceiling of the loft so that you could see the entirety of the space but it's not actually a view that you would be able to have in real life. Modeling the Razzari's house is pretty straightforward, minus the fact that some of Corbusier's dimensions in his drawings are incorrect. But beyond that, the building is pretty simple volume. It is made of three primary materials, stone, stucco, and wood, each playing a specific role in the design. One of the more unique elements of the house is the fireplace, which goes right underneath the ramp, that, the ramp that takes you up to the lofted bedroom above. Enter into the Razzari's house underneath the lofted bedroom. On the left is the kitchen area, and on the right is the main house. Right in front of us is a framed view out into the ocean. It's pretty dark and compressed in this area, and I'm surprised by how rustic the house is. I'm surrounded by rough hewn logs and rough stones. While I know houses like the Villa Savoie connect strongly with their context, usually through framed views and continuous paths of movement, this material connection with the landscape seems a lot different. When I turn right, I can either slip into the ramp or continue on to the rest of the house, which seems much lighter than the entry area. The angled roof doesn't seem so dramatic at first. The log structure just seems to line up and create what looks like a solid ceiling of wood. But as we move in further, we can see that it isn't and that the grandness of the space opens up to us. The fireplace is flanked perfectly by two columns, and it seems like a lot of geometry coming together. We can see the ramp go up, taking the ceiling with it. 
and the model doesn't include the vastness of the landscape, but it's interesting that the primary view is along the side of the mountain versus the smaller windows which run down perpendicular to it. Going up the ramp, my view is blocked, pretty much in all directions. The ramp is narrow and pushed right up against the back wall. Even looking up at the bedroom, I can't really see out of a window. The furniture blocks our view. When we finally get up there, we see the window with the thick extrusion and the seat underneath. Going to the guest room feels very exposed, like we're about to fall off a cliff. But once we're inside, it's a very pleasant space with a great window out into the landscape. <laughs> So I do have some conclusions about the Razzarie's house, and I think that it feels pretty dynamic, and, a, and it is a spatially integrated little cottage that is driven by a singular spatial idea of compression and release. However, there are some intricate moments of geometric complexity with the ramp and the column grid where there is some clash and friction when things don't quite line up. While it shares certain characteristics with, say, the Villa Savoie, like the presence of the ramp or the structure which doesn't align with the outside, it also has some more unique features like the materials which come directly from the landscape. This house is likely way more spacious than the California houses which copy it, since it doesn't need to provide a space for a full family. Rather, it's a celebration of a view and the landscape for a couple to retreat during the summer months. I truly hope that you enjoyed exploring the Razzarie's house with me. It's super fun learning more about these buildings that we can't visit anymore in the physical world. And also I enjoy building a platform for me and for everyone else to visit with. I actually don't do the 3D modeling of these buildings. That's done by my partner, Allison Newmeyer, who I'd like to thank for such her amazing and hard work on this. Thank you too for watching. If you enjoyed this video, you might enjoy others in the series that follow a similar format in the playlist called Inside Lost Architecture. Also, please consider giving the video a like and subscribe to the channel. And for maximum engagement, I'd love to build a conversation down in the chat about the Razzarie's house. What are your thoughts about it? How is it similar or different from other houses that you've seen or that you've seen with a butterfly roof? See you all in the discussion down below and in other videos. See you later.